Well, while we get started, so good afternoon. I want to welcome you to the, the 14th seminar in the Genomics uh, and Health Disparity Lecture Series, uh, which is co-sponsored by the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases, the National Human Genome Research Institute, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, as well as the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, and the Food and Drug Administration. This series was developed to uh, highlight research that address health disparities through a focus on genomics, uh, recognizing the challenges and, and making sure that these improvements are accessible and, and applicable to uh, all populations. And the speakers in this series approached uh, this problem from different areas of research, including basic science, population genomics, and translational and, and clinical research. Today's speaker uh, is Dr. Ali Garavi, and Dr. Garavi is the uh, J. Meltzer Professor of Nephrology and Hypertension and serves as the Chief of the Division of Nephrology at Columbia University's Irving Medical Center. He's also the director of the Center for Precision Medicine and Genomics in the Department of Medicine at Columbia University. <clears throat> Dr. Garavi is a principal investigator on, on multiple scientific projects funded by NIDDK and NHGRI at the front line of research focused on the molecular genetics of kidney diseases. He's uh, been a recipient of, of numerous awards and was elected to the American Society of Clinical Investigation and the American Association of Physicians. His work has led to the discovery of uh, genes and loci for glomerulonephritis, hypertension, kidney uh, allograft rejection, polycystic liver disease, and congenital defects of the kidney and the urinary tract. Uh, he has led some of the seminal research uh, in this country uh, pertaining to the genetics of IgA nephropathy, demonstrating the complex interplay um, between IgA-associated uh, gene loci with the risk of inflammatory bowel disease and the maintenance of the intestinal uh, epithelial barrier and response to local uh, mucosal pathogens which accounts for much of the noted geographic, um, uh, geographical and racial disparities of, of IgA nephropathy. His recent research has also demonstrated the utility of sequencing the, for, in the diagnosis and management of patients with nephropathy. And this work has uh, led to numerous publications, including, including uh, three recent New England Journal of Medicine publications in just the last two years. Uh, his ultimate goal is to bring personalized genomic uh, nephrology from the laboratory into patient care. So uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Garavi uh, here today to give us a seminar. Uh, you see the title there. I won't read it for you um, um, and tell us more about his work. So please help me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Garavi. Thank you for this kind introduction, Dr. Rogers. It's a big honor and a great pleasure to be here to give this talk uh, here. Um, and uh, I just let me just uh, get started. I've, I've been giving a talk at the NIH before, so it's really a, a real pleasure. So uh, just some disclosures, uh, some uh, funding through the Renal Research Institute and serving on advisory boards for a couple of companies over the years. Um, but ma my major disclosure, however, is that I'm not a health disparities researcher. I work on the genetics of kidney disease. We're trying to find why some people develop kidney failure and what's the underlying genetic cause of uh, disease. But through this, we've come to explore a number of issues related to health disparities, just as many other uh, genome researchers have gone through. Um, the central questions we're asking is the question that patients ask of us uh, when they see us in the clinic, or as researchers, we, are, we try to answer those through the, the work that we do in the laboratory. And the question questions are fairly simple. What is this disease that I have, doctor? Why do I have this disease? What will happen to me? And what are the treatment options that are available? And in fact, we use this set of questions to, for, uh, to sort of elaborate and develop the protocol for one of the NIDD case studies that I'm involved in, CureGN, because we wanted to make sure that we are responsive to the patient needs. And so I'm stealing this from sort of the overall goal and, uh, that we set for ourselves from, uh, for CureGN. 
A twist on this is that nowadays patients can come to us and ask doctors, should we perform genome sequencing to answer some of these questions? Uh, or even better, uh, they may have their genome sequenced in some way or another, uh, and they will come to the physicians and ask them to interpret the genome for them. And so that creates a fair amount of anxiety in your average physician. And so nonetheless, this is something that we all have to be aware of and sort of become very proficient in interpretation of the genome, or at least have a best friend who is very good at interpreting the genome so that we can refer them to that uh, individual uh, for interpretation of these results. Uh, all of this has come about because we've sequenced the Human Genome. The Human Genome Project gave us the first draft back in 2001, and now through now uh, uh, incredible advances in ge genomic uh, sequencing technology, we can read genomes in 24 hours under $1,000, which was unimaginable, uh, you know, just a decade ago. And as a result of this, now we can sample large populations and try to understand what is this genetic variation that we observe in this population, uh, which genetic variation is responsible for the disease in the patient in front of us, as opposed to what is background variation that we can uh, ignore in the, in the context of the patient uh, that we have. So my goal today is to just talk about how we've approached uh, sort of the genetics of kidney disease as we've applied successive ways of genomic technologies uh, to kidney disease, going through CKD epidemiology, but then, then talking about how we can diagnose rare genetic disorders through sequencing, talk about some major genetic risk factors, uh, mainly APOL1 how secondary findings, findings uh, through sequencing can influence our management and our approach to chronic kidney disease, and maybe discuss really briefly some uh, issues around predictive testing. So just some background epidemiological slide. Uh, this is data from NHANES. Uh, about 14% of the population has some level of kidney dysfunction. Uh, and you can see the different stages of chronic kidney disease from stage 1 to stage 5, 5 being the most severe. Uh, uh, CKD is an equal opportunity uh, disease, and when you look at the, when it comes down to health insurance, income, and education, it affects all strata of the population. However, when you start to look at people who develop kidney failure and need dialysis or a transplantation to, for survival, there's a big disparity in terms of ethnic and racial uh, composition, and you could see here that there's a lifetime risk of about, uh, let's see if I can do this right of uh, about 8% if you're an African American uh, for developing uh, end-stage kidney failure, and that number is about half, or less than half of that, uh, if you're a, a, a white ancestry. And you're probably somewhere in between if you're, uh, you know, of Hispanic ancestry. And so this is very apparent if you're a nephrologist and you walk into a dialysis clinic, you see a disproportionate number of African Americans who are on dialysis. So the question has always been why, and I think there's been major advances in genomics, uh, uh, in fact contributed by uh, people sitting in this room who have helped us explain this disparity uh, to, to a large extent, almost all of it, uh, in fact. So uh, the most common causes of uh, uh, death uh, in, uh, for chronic kidney disease are cardiovascular disease and cancer. So it's really, again, no different than the general population. It's just that this happens over a compressed period of time. Uh, and so if you look at survival in patients with end-stage kidney failure, well, you know, it's improved quite a bit over the years, but uh, it should be, it's not great still. So the overall survival rate uh, from in 2011, uh, five years after a starting on uh, dialysis, uh, of subformal dialysis is sometimes less than 50%. Uh, you do better with transplantation, uh, obviously, uh, particularly living donor transplantation. Uh, but in fact, there's some bias here because not everybody who gets selected for transplantation, uh, those typically are healthier uh, in general. Uh, but definitely, transplantation is the way to go when you're thinking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, improved survival uh, with end-stage kidney failure. Um, so how about detect detection of CKD is a real issue. Uh, and so many people, uh, this kidney disease uh, uh, is, can be silent for a long, long time uh, because the kidneys have an incredible reserve in terms of the, uh, you know, maintaining uh, health and, you know, maintaining function. So there must be ways to detect early, uh, kidney disease a little bit earlier. So we're lucky because we're part of the Electronic uh, uh, Health Record and Genomics Consortium, uh, which has had a, a lot of experience in terms of developing electronic phenotypes with detecting a number of disorders. Uh, and my colleague, Christoph Kirillok, has worked very hard over the last few years to develop an electronic algorithm for detection of CKD by parsing electronic health records, looking not only at kidney function, but also at urinalysis uh, and uh, urine protein creatinine ratio, and trying to automate this. 
uh, carefully. And I'm just have the left side of the slide, I really, you don't have to pay attention, just because to show that it was an enormously complicated rule-based uh, uh, algorithm to be able to develop this. And then he deployed this in 1.3 million individuals uh, across uh, our uh, medical records system at Columbia and also tested this in the eMERGE network. And so of these 1.3 million individuals, there were 240,000 that had some stage of CKD that were detected, but remarkably only 19% had a diagnostic or procedure code that was compatible with CKD. So you can imagine that there's going to be a large strata of the population that can be diagnosed earlier with chronic kidney disease and can, for, and for whom we can implement uh, you know, uh, you know, preventive interventions a lot sooner if we have such automated uh, algorithms deployed across different health uh, record system. And so we've validated this now across the eMERGE network, obviously, and this uh, the study is uh, about to be submitted. In the meantime, what can we do in terms of, in, uh, in addition to early detection of CKD with these algorithms? Well, you can start to start thinking about uh, heritability. And so here I'm highlighting the work by Nick Tadanetti, one of our colleagues in biomedical informatics at Columbia. We said, okay, well, how can we take uh, advantage of electronic health records to build pedigrees? Typically, when you look at heritability, you look at uh, families, you recruit them, you look at how concordant they are in terms of phenotypes that you're interested in. You know, this has been done, for example, for the Framingham Heart Study uh, for many years and heritability estimates have been uh, developed. Nick had this really interesting idea is that, well, for uh, fa family members who go see to the, to the same healthcare system, we're not very good at documenting familial relationship. However, if you look at emergency contact, you're likely to indicate a relative as your emergency contact. So it turns out that if you look through the healthcare system, uh, at least uh, or at Columbia, most people name their mothers as their, uh, uh, as their emergency contact. And so as a result of this, now if multiple people indicate the same person and as their mother, in fact, as their emergency contact, now you can start to build pedigrees. And so parsing our electronic health record system, Nick was able to build uh, pedigrees for 595,000 pedigrees and start to look at heritability for a large number of traits, many of whom hadn't been, of which hadn't been studied uh, using the sort of the standard epidemiological approach. And the heritability estimates that he came up with for 500 different disorders were very close, in fact, to what has been uh, reported previously, and there's some new ones that had never been uh, reported before. So this provides a lot of opportunities for testing heritability of rare diseases, such as the one I'm interested in, IgA nephropathy, testing shared heritability but between different diseases. Do some diseases occur more often that would be predicted by chance in the same family, and so you're able to do this uh, well. And then try to develop biological treatment and treatment hypotheses based on heritability results if some diseases are co-inherited more often together and there's efficacious treatment available for one of them, perhaps those can be applied across the board. At least you can think about the, uh, the, uh, the biology uh, and build some hypotheses around this. Um, uh, Christoph uh, ran this electronic uh, CKD algorithm, also tested heritability, and so identified, first of all, uh, through this uh, electronic health algorithm, all the comorbidities that are associated with different stages of CKD. This is too small to, uh, to, to really project well, but you can see diabetes, hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, hypothyroidism, uh, metastases, cancer, and so forth. So you could see this, what is the morbidity map for CKD across different stages, but then you can also now look at heritability. And one of the things that hadn't been done very carefully for heritability for CKD is looking at it through different at different uh, through different ethnicities, and you could see that looking here at different at Hispanics, whites, and blacks here, heritability for CKD is much greater for uh, blacks compared to white populations, and Hispanics tend to be somewhere in between. So telling us that perhaps there are stronger or different types of or the load of genetic factors may be different because different ethnicities. So I think this is going to be one step forward as we're trying to sort of sort through things and try to identify genetic contributions is a little bit better as we move forward. And then once we couple this to genetic uh, data, in fact, uh, we're going to be able to make uh, discoveries uh, also stratified based on ethnicity and family, family data. So how about looking at uh, rare genetic diseases? What is lurking behind this heritability, increased heritability for uh, chronic kidney disease? Well, uh, we've, over the past uh, few years, we've applied a number of different genomic technologies to chronic kidney disease, mostly congenital malformations, because these are obviously more loaded for having genetic disorders. And we've, particularly looking at microarray studies, we've identified a large number of copy number disorders or genomic disorders in kids with chronic kidney disease. And these copy number disorders were sort of 
well-known brand name disorders such as the George syndrome or 17Q12 microdeletion syndromes uh, that were basically not picked up during routine clinical evaluation. And this told us that you know, as we're searching for new genes and new loci and risk factors for kidney disease, we're actually making clinical diagnoses that are important in the clinic and we should find ways to sort of introduce this into healthcare. When exome sequencing came online with the pilot study in, uh, in uh, adults with chronic kidney disease, uh, and we saw a diagnostic rate of about 25% in a selected population of 92 cases with early onset CKD or kidney disease of uh, unknown cause. And so we wanted to do this now at scale, however, you know, to be able to convince ourselves that there is a utility for genomic technology with diagnosis or management of kidney disease. Um, but uh, we, so we had to look for funding and ability to do this with large, build a large biobank at Columbia, of patients who had come to see us, but now we need to be able to sequence them. So at this time, we were very lucky that David Goldstein joined, who's a, who's a, a geneticist, uh, joined us to lead the Institute of Genomic Medicine uh, at Columbia, and I managed to convince him, based on these data, that uh, kidney disease is the most important disease on this planet, and that that's what he really needs to study. Uh, and so fortunately, he believed me, and so we wound up doing the study that was led by Emily Group and a really talented MD-PhD student in my lab. She's now completed her PhD and has gone on to clinical uh, rotations. So we had 2,200 cases with chronic kidney disease from Columbia, and then we also partnered with the AstraZeneca, who had a biobank of about 1,100 cases from a, a clinical trial of statins in patients with end-stage kidney failure. So altogether, we had about 3,300 cases with uh, kidney failure or chronic kidney disease that we then that underwent whole exome sequencing. We wind up doing variant annotation based on the American College of Medical Genetics diagnostic sequence uh, interpretation. And so this is a cohort uh, in the study that was published earlier this year in the New England Journal, uh, where we had most mostly an uh, adult population. 90% of them were uh, adults. Uh, equal distributions between male and female. And then importantly, we had a really nice distribution across different ethnicities, uh, reflective of the you know, diversity of a population that uh, develops uh, kidney failure. And important for genetic studies because many of the many genetic studies, as you know, have been primarily conducted in populations of European ancestry. And so we wanted to make sure that whatever we do is going to be applicable across ancestries. Um, we wind up also including uh, uh, patients in different clinical categories that are relevant in practice, so congenital or cystic diseases, glomerulopathy, diabetic nephropathy, hypertensive nephropathy, tuber interstitial diseases, and then really an imp another important clinical category, which is chronic kidney disease of unknown cause. It turns out somewhere around 5 to 15 percent of patients with chronic kidney disease, depending on the series that you look at, have kidney disease of unknown cause. They show up too late, and no diagnostic test is really going to be revealing of what they have. And so frustrating for the patients, for the doctors, not quite sure what's going to happen to them. And so those fundamental questions that the patients ask of us, we're unable to answer, what is this disease? In terms of looking at family history, as I mentioned, about a third of the patients had a positive family history of kidney disease. So this is the punchline uh, of the, the study. Um, you know, we had an overall diagnostic rate of about 9% in this population, uh, but the diagnostic rate varied between different clinical categories. Uh, and so the highest diagnostic rate was seen in patients with congenital cystic kidney diseases, about 25%. On the other side of the spectrum, we had diabetic and hypertensive nephropathy, where the diagnostic rate for a Mendelian disease was about 1% to 2%. And so this told us that clinical evaluation by a nephrologist year is going to be really important before you send somebody and will help you determine what is going to be the diagnostic yield for sequencing for this population. It also told us that, that we can have some confidence in the clinical evaluation by a nephrologist. So typically hypertensive nephropathy or diabetic nephropathy is not diagnosed based on you know, a kidney biopsy. It's a clinical diagnosis. And so we, there weren't a lot of genetic diagnoses being missed in this particular category. Um, the big surprise for us was in this category of chronic kidney disease or end-stage kidney failure of unknown cause, where we had a 17% diagnostic rate. So this is, if you're talking about health disparities, this is a population that, you know, essentially is not able to, for whom we're not able to provide the very first basic uh, answer to their question. And so here, at least one in five, one in six individuals 
you will be able to provide an answer. Um, this is, you know, again, a chronic kidney disease population uh, that has been evaluated by a tertiary care medical practice or was, uh, you know, enrolled in a clinical trial. So this is not somebody who, people who just came in and had an elevated creatinine and people didn't think about them too much. So I, I want to emphasize this. So this doesn't mean that we can just send exomes for anybody where we just don't want to think about the patient. But nonetheless, I think this is very uh, heartening. And so this has been also reproduced across smaller data sets nowadays where uh, looking at transplant populations, people have seen exactly the same thing. You can explain a lot of CKD of unknown cause that way. So what lur lurks behind these uh, diagnoses? We had 307 patients who had the Mendelian genetic disorders, but there were 66 different genetic disorders that we identified. There were six genes that accounted for, you know, 60% of the diagnoses. So polycystic uh, kidney, PKD1 and PKD2, diagnostic of uh, dominant polycystic kidney disease, made up of a good chunk of the population. Many of these patients already had a diagnosis of a, uh, you know, cystic kidney disease. So this didn't come as a big surprise. Uh, the collagen mutations was much more frequent that uh, we expected, and I'll go over this in a minute, and uromodulin diagnostic of uh, autosomal dominant uh, tubular interstitial nephropathy. And then those the remaining 60 genes were distributed around 40% of the patients. So virtually, there were uh, one or two patients only had a distinct genetic syndrome for each one of these uh, genetic syndromes. And, you know, and most of these rare genetic syndromes were not picked up in the clinic during clinical evaluation. So telling us that there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity and there's a subgroup of patients who come in with these rare genetic disorders not picked up in the clinic that uh, could be diagnosed this way through exome sequencing. So, let me give you some case scenarios. This is a 57-year-old who is diag nearly diagnosed with kidney uh, disease with blood and protein in the urine. And the kidney biopsy was performed, uh, and the patient had uh, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, which is a form of nephrotic syndrome. Uh, and this type of uh, disorder is usually treated with, imp uh, you know, sort of empiric uh, immunosuppressive therapy. He came to us uh, for a second opinion, should I go on steroids and immunosuppressive therapy? And when we reviewed the biopsy, we thought there were some unusual features. We have really good pathologists uh, at Columbia, and they thought maybe there's some secondary features. Maybe this is not going to be the type that's going to be uh, responsive, but we couldn't be sure. When we did the exome sequencing, we found that the, the patient had a dominant form of Alport syndrome, a heterozygous mutation type of four collagen genes, uh, call 4A4 exactly. So this is a structural defect in the kidney, um, and so Alport syndrome really is presents in this classic form. Uh, it would, uh, is due to mutations in one of three genes, call 4A3, A4, uh, which are responsible for autosomal dominant or recessive forms of the disease, and call 4A5, which is the classic X-linked, which presents with hematuria, sensory neural deafness, some really classic findings on kidney biopsy, and then some uh, eye findings as well. So it turns out that most patients who have type 4 collagen, type 4 A3 and A4 mutations don't have this classic presentation, and increasingly we're finding them presenting in this manner. Uh, and so the advice to the patient was, in this case, this is a structural problem in the kidney. Uh, you got to avoid steroids, uh, and then we referred uh, him to a new clinical trial uh, for that was underway for uh, Alport syndrome. And then we started to screen family members at risk and also figuring out potential, figuring out also potential donors for, uh, for transplantation. So it turns out that uh, type 4 collagen mutations were the most commonly missed diagnoses uh, uh, in the cohort that we sequenced. And here, this is this, we had 92 patients who had pathogenic mutations in call for A3, A4, or A5. And only 40% of them, under 40% of them, had a diagnosis of Alport syndrome or thin basement membrane disease, which is a related disease. The remainder had, you know, CK were that labeled as CKD of unknown cause, hypertensive nephropathy. Glomerular nephritis not otherwise specified, and this important category of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. And this is an important category to recognize again because these patients are empirically subjected to immunosuppressive therapy with no hope of actually that they would uh, respond in any way, and they would only be subjected to the side effects and the deleterious effect of immunosuppression. So really important to recognize this and really illustrative of the fact that there are some classic syndromes that have been described in the literature, but perhaps as we're sequencing patients and we're ascertaining individuals through sequencing first, the most common, the most the classic presentation of disease is really not the most common presentation uh, that we will see in the clinic. And so we need to be aware of this uh, as we go forward.
Um, and this is something that's uh, uh, you know, been recognized by others now, multiple papers showing that your type 4 collagen mutations are caused focal sclerosis or are commonly mistaken, uh, mistaken for FSGS, and we need to be uh, aware of this. Um, so there are consensus uh, you know, statements that have come out as a result of this saying that anybody who has a heterozygous mutation uh, or uh, that's detected through sequencing should be not labeled as having Alport syndrome. And so, uh, so the question really is, and there are also consensus guidelines that say, well, maybe that shouldn't be the case, and they should be diagnosed as having type 4 or being at risk for call 4 associated nephropathy. And the reason for this is thinking about health disparities and about genetic labeling of individuals. Uh, diagnosing somebody with Alport syndrome I and mean, putting this into their health records when they have a heterozygous variant in this one of these uh, genes, particularly if they're a family member of somebody who's affected and you're now a carrier, it's not clear whether you're going to develop disease or what time, we don't have enough data, but labeling them as Alport syndrome will have really important consequences for insurability, uh, especially disability insurance, health insurance, uh, and so I think that we need to think about this a little bit. So genetic testing here can provide you, you know, uh, an early diagnosis diagnosis uh, for patients, identify folks who are at risk, but you know, have to, yeah, but that comes with the risk of labeling them. So this, we need to think about this carefully, and I think this is not the only case that we're seeing in nephrology, and this is uh, across the board in other disciplines. Here's another case. This is a 20-year-old who was admitted uh, after a suicide attempt, um, and he has no formal psychiatric history, but then you know, he has a history of neurocognitive impairment growing up, uh, poor learning, poor, you know, uh, 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 social communications. He dropped out of school at age 16, uh, and uh, his mother, and, and actually was estranged from his family, uh, and then his mother could, uh, called me when he was admitted for the suicide attempt, and she called me because he has a history of solitary, of a solitary kidney diagnosed at birth, and he was told he's going to be just fine. She had asked his pediatric nephrologist whether the kidney disease and neurocognitive impairment were related, and had been told no, but then based on some of the work we had done, she said, well, maybe we should do genetic testing because we think that uh, this, these things may be related. Contrast this to another one patient that was seen uh, in our clinic, 64-year-old, who was referred to us with low magnesium in the blood, but on workup was found to have numerous cysts in both kidneys. The renal function was okay. When you talked to her, she said, oh, doctor, every time you do a test in me, I find you find something new over the years. People have found I have diabetes. I could never have kids because I have uterine malformations. And then we did some more blood tests, uh, and she had also elevated PTH. She had no formal history of psychiatric disease, but she said she could not finish uh, college, even though she tried for many years. And that she thought there's something I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. So um, these two individuals have exactly the same diagnosis. They have a mutation in uh, this transcription factor called HNF1 beta, uh, which causes uh, a syndrome called renal cysts and diabetes syndrome. Uh, sometimes there's a the microdeletion that encompasses this gene, and, that's, that's what, uh, and the microdeletion encompasses 1.2 million bases, and it's called the 17Q12 uh, syndrome. Um, it's also known as maturity onset diabetes type 5 of the young type 5. And all these are different disorders. So HNF1 beta is a transcription factor. It is expressed in multiple tissues, uh, including the kidney, where it controls the, uh, the expression of multiple genes that have been implicated in polycystic kidney disease, such as PKD2, PKHD1, UMOD, for tubular interstitial nephropathy, but also controls the expression of a number of tra uh, 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 transcription factors and pathways responsible for uh, beta cell uh, development. Uh, it also uh, controls the expression of a number of genes important for the GU tract development. As a consequence, then, mutations in this gene causes, cause a number of different uh, complications illustrated here. So the most common abnormality is the kidney malformations presenting as single kidneys, renal cysts, hypoplastic kidneys, or a lot of different uh, manifestations uh, uh, due to the same mutation. The patients also have abnormalities in handling magnesium, hence the reason why the second patient was referred to us. They, ha they have abnormalities in handling gout. They have early onset gout, which is typically in disproportion to the level of kidney dysfunction. Um, they have genital tract malformations. Um, uh, uterine malformations is a very common one, so hence issues with uh, conceiving and 
And in addition, uh, they have pancreatic hypoplasia. The, uh, the diabetes typically occurs later in life, in their 20s and 30s. Um, and so uh, they're, they're prone to developing diabetes. And uh, you know, pe most people, you know, no, not the kidney malformation, but they don't really, uh, they figure this is maybe type two, regular type two diabetes when people develop this in their 20s and 30s. But it has, this has important uh, implications, particularly if you diagnose this before they develop uh, uh, the diabetes, because you can try to teach your patients about uh, weight management. If they develop kidney failure, then you really need to tailor the immunosuppression regimen carefully because steroids can produce diabetes, induce, uh, induce insulin resistance. And so this has implications for management. In addition, large studies have now shown that in individuals who have the 17Q12 microdeletion, there is a two to three-fold increased risk of intellectual disability, autism, and schizophrenia. So right here, you could see how this mutation, this one uh, transcription factor, can explain the clinical presentation in the first patient and ties in the kidney malformation together with the neurocognitive issues in the first patient, a 20-year-old with a suicide attempt. Uh, and so the mother was right that there's a connection between the two of them. Uh, and so there's all these uh, types of different uh, sort of management issues that we can uh, discuss with the patients, such as weight management, immunosuppression re uh, regimen, uh, issues uh, surrounding gout, and thinking about uh, long-term kidney function. In the second patient, we could tell her that uh, it's this wasn't a succession of bad luck that uh, created all these different complications. It was just a genetic mutation that resulted in all these complications. Uh, and so that actually had a profound effect in both of the patients in terms of uh, once we tell them the results, because this explained a number of past events that were not otherwise uh, explainable and seemed completely uh, random to them. Um, this, this finding of neurocognitive dysfunction is actually important in the setting of chronic kidney disease because uh, impaired neurocognitive function has been and is a known complication, particularly in children with uh, chronic disease, but also been noted in, uh, uh, in adults with chronic kidney disease. Most of this has been attributed to sort of the metabolic burden of, uh, of a chronic disease, uh, and the promise that's been made, particularly for the pediatric population, is that if they undergo a kidney transplantation and the the metabolic defects are corrected, then the neurocognitive uh, function will go back to baseline and the kids will catch up. Well, one of the things that we did find uh, in this uh, population uh, is a very high rate of genomic disorders and genomic imbalances. And so when we looked at two studies now in a 2NADDK cohorts, one is uh, the chronic kidney disease uh, in uh, children's study, uh, and as well as the chronic insufficiency cohort, uh, there's a very high prevalence of genomic disorders uh, in this population, uh, about 8% in children and about 1.5% in adults with CKD. The prevalence rate in the general population is somewhere between 0.3 to 0.5 percent. So there's an enormous uh, excess risk of these genomic disorders. There are 45 different disorders. These are all well cataloged, well known as being pathogenic in the literature. Again, some of them are really well known, such as the chromosome 22Q11.2, uh, uh, the microdeletion syndrome, the DeGeorge syndrome. The 17Q12 uh, microdeletion that I was just telling you is also really common, and you can see all of them. Most of these microdeletions uh, have been described in the literature in the context of schizophrenia, autism, and neurodevelopmental delay, uh, but uh, also in terms of congenital heart disease. So basically, this told us that these are syndromes that are presenting uh, to different clinicians. The cardiologist is taking care of the microdeletion <laughs> heart defect. The neurologist or the pediatric psychiatrist is taking care of the neuropsychiatric issues. The pediatrician, pedi pediatric nephrologist is taking care of the, neuro, uh, the kidney problem, but they're not always putting the whole thing together. And so it's just through genetic testing that you're able to, 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 to address this. And so that has an important implication in terms of thinking about the next step for the patient's uh, care because, well, if you have a genetic lesion that predisposes to kidney failure, heart, uh, you know, heart malformations, neurodevelopmental malformation uh, defects, you know, fixing the kidney failure is going to be great for the patient's health, but it's not necessarily going to address the neurodevelopmental issues. And so, in fact, when we looked uh, in the CKID cohort, uh, looking at kids who had one of the carriers of one of these genomic disorders and those that didn't, there was like an eight-point difference in IQ, which was highly uh, statistically significant. There was, they scored also the higher on, uh, uh, on the executive uh, abnormalities and executive function functioning, uh, as well as uh, sort of the ability to make uh, the decision-making and then on depression scores uh, as well. And all of this was independent of the severity of kidney disease.
Similarly, we've looked at the CRIC cohort where we have a mini manual status exam, and sure enough, uh, the genomic disorder carriers are less likely to complete uh, high school uh, and also score lower on their mini manual status ex exam uh, right from the beginning. So this tells us that this is a comorbidity that we see in CKD, but the causal relationship may not be related to the severity of chronic kidney disease. It may be related to the genetic disorder that impacts both. And in thinking about these uh, patient population, I think it's important to recognize this and how genomics can empower you in trying to take better care of them uh, as we move forward and not misattribute uh, some of these complications just to chronic kidney disease. So how about, uh, you know, uh, some of the genetic risk factors for, uh, uh, for uh, kidney failure? And here I'm going to talk to you with April, about APOL1 uh, with some trepidation because here we have Dr. Kopp, Dr. Winkler, Dr. Parsa, who've made seminal contributions to our understanding and discovery of uh, uh, APOL1. Uh, but so, so bear with me uh, and don't correct me if I say anything wrong. Uh, <laughs> so this... So you know, one of the major advances here came uh, back in 2008, where both uh, Cheryl and uh, uh, and Jeffrey uh, wind up mapping uh, the, uh, the the locus for uh, 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 for this disparity in uh, increased dis uh, increased risk of end stage kidney failure in African Americans. And here they use an admixture mapping uh, approach and found a really you know a strong uh, signal on chromosome 22, uh, and this really explained essentially all the excess risk of end stage kidney failure, hypertensive-related end-stage kidney failure, uh, uh, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, uh, and HIV nephropathy in the cohorts that they studied. Uh, and then Martin Pollock's uh, group wind up following this up uh, by doing some fine mapping and, and precisely mapped this to two variants in the apolipoprotein L1 uh, locus in, the, in this gene where you have two variants uh, on two haplotypes, G1 and G2, which are a completely distinct haplotype and arose independently uh, in APOL1. APOL1 is a, a apolipoprotein circulating uh, uh, and it's a part of uh, HDL3 uh, in circulation. Uh, and uh, what we knew about uh, APOL1 is that it uh, protects against uh, sleeping sickness, uh, specifically about a subtype of uh, trypanosomiasis, uh, the Rhodesiense uh, subtype. Uh, this uh, particular parasite had evolved a serum resistance factor, which prevented uh, APOL1 from lysing uh, the, the, the uh, in, uh, from entering the lysosome and helping lyse in defense uh, of the of the parasite. And what's happened over the years is that in the genetic arms race, essentially humans have evolved these two variants in APOL1, uh, which then bypass this resistance factor and enable sort of protection against sleeping sickness. And so this is a classic uh, sort of uh, heterozygote advantage uh, that has uh, you know, spread like wildfire, particularly in West Africa, and here you can see the distribution of the G1 and G2 allele, particularly you could see it's very high in uh, West Africa. Um, but this, come, this has come at the expense of uh, having increased susceptibility to kidney failure uh, in homozygosity when you have two uh, risk variants uh, uh, together. And so you could see this enormous risk of kidney failure here attributed to uh, uh, you know, having biallelic risk, uh, uh, dual risk genotypes uh, at the APOL1 locus. Uh, you could see these enormous odds ratios for HIV nephropathy, uh, for FSGS, and then end-stage kidney failure, uh, non-diabetic end-stage kidney failure across different populations. And so there are many, many studies that have replicated this over and over again. It's very clear that this is a really major uh, you know, risk factor and explains most of the variation and the risk in kidney failure in uh, African Americans uh, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, as we see it. So uh, Afshin has gone on and showed, also showed that uh, there's uh, APOL1 is a major risk factor for progression of kidney failure. Um, and what was, what's really interesting is that in terms of increased susceptibility, uh, it, the, the dual risk genotype increases susceptibility to what we used to know as hypertensive nephrosclerosis, FSGS, and HIVAN, but not to diabetic kidney disease. Nonetheless, APOL1 is a risk factor for progression of nephropathy. Uh, and so here you could see the bars with the high risk uh, individuals with high risk experience, whether they have diabetes or not, they're much more likely to progress uh, to, uh, uh, to kidney failure. What's also really interesting here is that, you know, in terms of thinking about disparities, here this is the curve for uh, white individuals, and even black individuals who have the low-risk variant have an intermediate uh, risk of uh, kidney failure, telling us that there are additional factors that may be influencing the risk of progression uh, to kidney disease in this population. I think this is going to be a really interesting uh, study to follow up on uh, to understand what are all these different uh, you know, risk factors involved.
So these, some of these questions then, then come about in clinic then, you know, is, is exemplified here. A 35-year-old African-American man who is diagnosed with focal sclerosis and has uh, chronic kidney disease. He has a brother who has kidney failure is on dialysis. Now he's thinking about the preemptive transplant. Uh, and so the question is, who should donate in, in the family? Should he get, uh, you know, should, be, should any living uh, the related donor uh, 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 donate to him? What will happen to the kidney uh, that's donated? What would happen to the patient, uh, the, the individual who's donated? to the kidney. The reason for this is that here, looking at the Morgan Graham's work, uh, it's very clear that looking at the two bars that are up here, the lifetime projected instant incidence of end-stage kidney disease is much higher among African Americans compared to uh, non-African Americans, to white men and women. And so the question is, what is the, what is the, uh, what is the reason for this? We still don't know, but there are certainly there's an elevated risk. And so when you're thinking about somebody who's going to donate at age 20, well, the risk of lifetime risk of kidney failure is considerable. You know? So you have to think about this a little bit more carefully than those that, uh, uh, you know, uh, than uh, somebody who's uh, non-African American. So, so what's the role of APOL1 genetic testing in CKD care? Uh, should living-related donors be considered? And so how would that change the, our ability to allocate organs for African Americans? African Americans uh, compose a disproportionate number of uh, individuals with end-stage kidney failure, but there's a lower donation rate among the African American community, so it's more difficult to find compatible uh, you know, uh, uh, donors uh, as well. Uh, so if we start you know, uh, excluding some patients uh, based on their APOL1 genotype, how is that going to, is that going to create a different disparity? And so this is uh, important because, well, we have data from this. This is data from Jeff Kopp's group uh, showing, this is a really nice study with longitudinal follow-up, showing that the APOL1 risk genotypes in African Americans, uh, when they have their live kidney donors, they have lower pre- and post-donation renal function. This is up to 17 years of follow-up from what I, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, nonetheless, when you, when you, in the aggregate, you see these really big differences. Nonetheless, when you look at other studies, when they looked at the uh, individuals, population-based studies, and looking at the decline in renal function, it's very clear that if you have the high-risk blacks with high-risk genotypes, have a steeper decline in kidney function. Nonetheless, there's a lot of overlap between different individuals who do and do not have the risk allele. So how do you personalize this, and how are you going to go about doing this uh, you know, well? And this has tremendous Im implications. So, we wrote this case uh, series in precision medicine around this topic in the annals of internal medicine, and sort of to, to sort of make things a little interesting, we, we asked, what is the probability that a living related individual to somebody who already has, uh, who has a, uh, the APOL1 risk genotype uh, will also have a risk uh, genotype? And it's, you know, I was actually really surprised by these calculations. So if the index case has a risk genotype, then the sibling has about a 50% chance of actually having the risk genotype, which doesn't intuitively make sense if you're thinking about just sort of a risk factor. Uh, and that's, you know, but because this is so common in the population and because you ascertain from family, families which are enriched by APOL1 risk variants, once you condition on somebody who already has dual risk genotypes, then you're talking about really uh, a high risk family to begin with. So, uh, so I commend the uh, NIDDK and the NIH to initiating the Apollo study, which is going to prospectively look at the risk of kidney donation in African Americans who are undergoing uh, kidney transplantation. I mean, this is a super important and uh, really uh, exciting study where Columbia is one of the participating sites, so I look forward to getting the results because I think this is going to be really important to get this right uh, as we move forward uh, to, you know, to match the right person to the, to the, with the right kidney. Um, so, and, and another way to do this is try to come up with better ways of matching kidneys. And so one of the things we wind up doing is for many years is to study this phenomenon of rejection. Um, uh, this was work that was done in collaboration with Christoph Kerlock and led by Nick Steers, who are, who's our, uh, uh, you know, uh, card-carrying immunologist in our group. Uh, we hypothesized that beyond H HLA, there may be other risk loci for rejection uh, of kidney transplants. And the way we've wound up thinking about it is that if there are a lot of genes that are non-essential, and some people are knocking, uh, walking around as knockouts for these uh, genes. So if I have a knockout for a particular gene that's uh, non-essential, uh, but I need a kidney transplant at some point, and I get a wild-type kidney, my immune system may recognize that particular uh, protein that's encoded by that gene as a novel antigen and may mount an immune response. And so we wind up doing a screen of the genome and identified one locus uh, that's uh, this locus limbs one, which is associated with a risk of uh, rejection very earlier on after transplantation. 
And this was replicated across four different cohorts uh, internationally. Uh, and the risk conferred by this uh, risk genotype is equivalent to having three HLA mismatched. Uh, and so what we could see also is these individuals who have what uh, Christoph coined as the collision genotype, uh, they have uh, increased antibody levels to limbs, one that can be detected. It's interesting that the antibodies of the IgG2 and IgG3 subclass, so we're gonna have to investigate further to, to see how this plays out. But this provides you with a framework to try to think about how you're going to now better match your kidneys uh, for your donors and recipients going forward, and I think this is gonna be exciting as we pursue this on a genome-wide scale. So, how about secondary findings uh, in uh, chronic kidney disease? Uh, this was a case that was sort of the index case for me, which sort of, uh, you know, when a light bulb went off. Uh, here's a 63-year-old who has this really rare immune-mediated disease, uh, fibrillary glomerulonephritis, that we don't understand. Well, you know, uh, we did exome sequencing nonetheless, and predictably there are no known genes for this disease. We didn't find anything that could explain it. Um, However, what we did find is the patient had a you know, pathogenic BRCA2 mutation uh, that was detected because we looked not just at the kidney disease gene, but also at the list of actionable mutations that are in the genome. Uh, and by the time we got back to the patient, the patient had had a mammogram and was found to have uh, breast cancer. Uh, when we informed the, her oncologist about this, um, this completely changed the way he was approaching the treatment because the BRCA positive breast cancer is treated very differently than your garden variety breast cancer. And so because of her age, uh, she actually opted for bilateral mastectomy because there's a high risk of recurrence here. She's being screened for, uh, for ovarian cancer and other complications as well. We did cascade testing in the family. Whether she had two daughters who also carried the dress genotype in there thinking about prophylactic procedures. And this was early onset disease, but nonetheless, uh, if this was to progress to uh, advanced disease, now there's specific targeted therapy that's available for breast cancers with PARP inhibitors. So this also has implication for therapy in the future if she ever gets, uh, if, she, if she unfortunately progresses. And then when I started going back and thinking about sort of the therapy for this patient and their kidney disease, because that's why they came to us for, we were trying to give them results about kidney, about cancer predisposition, we realized that the patient is on immunosuppression. And so in thinking about immunosuppression, well, you know, you think about a lot of our patients who are, have kidney disease have, uh, or candidates at least for immunosuppression, if not their kidney transplant patients. And, you know, immunosuppression is a major risk factor for cancer in uh, patients with, uh, who have undergone, uh, you know, transplantation. So we had to think about, and most have people who have glomerulonephritis, they are subjected to immunosuppression as well. So we have to think about the dosage and timing of immunosuppression in this population. And so this is a novel area for us to think about because here's the secondary finding, but the secondary finding has implications for the management of the kidney disease uh, that uh, the reason why they, they came to us for. So... Um, in fact, we have many secondary findings that have implications for kidney disease management. I talked to you about immunosuppression for, uh, uh, for you know, in patients who are predisposed to cancer, but many patients are diabetic, diabetic and they're on insulin therapy. And so if you look at the epidemiology, uh, insulin therapy is also associated with increased risk of cancer epidemiologically. And so thinking about, again, somebody who's prone to cancer, uh, maybe you don't think about you know, a high-dose insulin therapy, and maybe you go to alternative regimens in this population as well. Our patients are anemic, uh, and they're an erythropoietin, and those drugs are also associated with risk of uh, you know, uh, cancer. So maybe we should think about adjusting the dose of immunosuppressive therapy in this population. Um, a subset of patients had familiar uh, the, uh, genetic uh, diagnosis of cardiomyopathy or, or uh, cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, and so here, electrolyte management and the choice of antihypertensive therapy, anti therapy is also very important uh, in terms of managing uh, their kidney disease. And so we have to change the, the way we think about it. Um, we saw you know, malignant hypothermia, susceptibility for your chromocytoma. Uh, our patients undergo a lot of procedures, vascular procedures, and so knowing about these things pre-op would really help as well. So we've gone from thinking about these as secondary findings uh, that are non-related to incidental findings of renal significance. So I think that that's going to be a, an important area for us to explore uh, as we go through uh, genetics, not just for kidney diseases, but across the different board, because the patients have many, many other types of uh, conditions, heart disease, diabetes, and so forth. And we have to think about these secondary findings and how they impact uh, the, the primary sort of disease that they came to see you for. Um, 
We also jumped into the sort of return of results realm, uh, you know, uh, in part as part of our activity in the eMERGE network. And so here, this is Jordan Nestor, our precision medicine uh, renal fellow, who's really uh, uh, spearheaded the, the return of result uh, process for us. Uh, and so we've, it's, it's been an interesting experience as we're trying to deploy this in the clinic, whether we're doing clinical grade sequencing or research grade sequencing, uh, because there are a number of barriers that we've had to think about, which, you know, workforce that we've had to, uh, you know, deploy. We have genetic counsel now that we have in our renal clinic, uh, as well as, you know, we have much closer contact to pathologists and molecular diagnosticians. We have a sign-out, uh, you know, uh, uh, board, uh, just like you have a tumor board, to be able to go through the variants and adjudicate them to see whether they're real. But, uh, you know, the return of results to the patients is interesting because we have to tailor this to English and non-English speaking populations to explain things, uh, why we're doing this, what's the importance of uh, how, to, how to go about things. Uh, we've had situations where people have refused confirmation uh, of results when they're available. Uh, people are refusing to inform family members who may be at risk, so we've had to come up with ways of circumnavigating this. Um, there's a lot of clinician apprehension about genetic testing, particularly about the secondary findings that they didn't ask for. They only came to me and asked me, why does this patient, does this patient have a genetic kidney disease? Now you're telling me about predisposition to breast cancer. Uh, what am I going to do with this, and what am I going to explain to the patient? Um, there are, there's patient and provider concerns about transplant eligibility. I think this is one area that really needs to be explored about this. Does that, are we going to label these patients that have a genetic disorder and poor outcome? And, or, or are we going to say, we know exactly what you have, what complications you're going to have, and so you're better prepared for a transplantation than your average patient? So I think we'll need to do the study to do this. And then some of the variants get reclassified over time uh, because our knowledge expands. Uh, so we find new genetic diagnoses. Some variants that were uh, variants of unknown significance get classified as being diagnostic. Some diagnostic variants after some additional studies are downgraded. So I think we have to deal with all of this. So, We've tried to develop tools for uh, patients and then assess the efficacy of these tools. For example, these are clinical vignettes uh, for patients to consider as we're returning the results. So this one is, says, the, the doctor, the letter said, no genetic risk factors were identified. So will I ever get a genetic disease uh, once I've been tested negative? And so the answer is, of course, no. You may be getting still, you know, if you don't have a genetic cause for breast cancer, you may have, you still may get breast cancer from other causes. And so you'd be surprised. Most uh, patients don't understand this concept, and they tell you that, uh, I have a clean bill of health based on genetic testing. Hila Rasuli, uh, a talented uh, physician, uh, a scientist who's also a genetic counselor in, a, in the lab, developed this really rapid test for testing genetic literacy. It takes a two-minute test. It's a work recognition uh, uh, test. Uh, and it turns out uh, somewhere like 50% of the patients don't understand words that we typically commonly use in uh, genetic testing, such as penetrance, heterozygosity, actionability. So we need to do a better job in terms of explaining things to them. And so these types of tools will help us enable us to assess things a lot better. Um, and then maybe two minutes on predictive testing uh, on, uh, uh, for, for genetic diseases. Um, we had to develop a catalog of uh, you know, genes that uh, cause uh, kidney failure uh, because there's no an effort to look for kidneys, uh, for kidney annotation, although that's changing now and there's now a kidney group that's being formed. Uh, but when we annotated 700, 650 genes that we had found to be associated with kidney or urologic disorders in 8,000 individuals who were self-declared to be healthy, uh, we wind up doing some basic filtering, which is just looking at a leave frequency of 1% and then looking at previously purported pathogenic variants uh, in ClinVar or HGMD. And this is the 1% cutoff is what's the sort of the starting point based on the American College of Medical Genetics uh, diagnostic criteria. We found something absurd. 22% of these healthy individuals had a genetic variant that could have been uh, classified as a risk factor or a, a diagnostic for kidney disease. So this told us that we need to do a much better job of cleaning data sets because most of these were attributable to previously reported variants that uh, uh, were erroneously reported as being pathogenic. And so we need to, you know, clean up the databases a lot better. But still, once, once we wind up doing a lot more stringent filtering and we did manual curation of the variants, we still wind up with 1% of individuals who wind up with a variant that kind of looked really suspicious. And so 
These are the type of variants that may be returned as incidental findings to patients with so somebody who gets sequencing for other reasons, and then this gets discovered, and then this generates a referral to, a path, uh, to a nephrologist, which then necessitates maybe you know, evaluation, more healthcare expenditure, a lot of anxiety uh, for everybody. So we need to do a better job of cleaning up, but also finding better ways of you know, diagnosing patients uh, and making uh, rigorous calls based on uh, genetic uh, analysis. And we're not alone in the kidney field. This has been picked up across the, the genetics community is really well aware of this issue. Uh, and uh, some of this is exacerbated by the fact that the variant databases have been are enriched for European populations. So many variants that are rare in European populations when be common in other ethnicities may be mislabeled as being pathogenic. And so this was one of the sort of index papers that really showed the, the potential for genetic mis misdiagnosis uh, in, in the population. So. Uh, uh, the, the other part about risk factors and thinking about uh, health disparities is this issue of polygenic risk scores, so summing up all the genetic variants across the genome to try to identify people who are at highest risk, not because they have a single genetic uh, variant that increases risk of disease, but it's in the aggregate that their genome essentially is loaded with genetic risk factors for a particular disease. So uh, these are two seminal papers that were just published uh, in their classics already. This is looking, this is work from uh, say Catherine's lab at the Broad. Uh, where he showed for coronary heart disease that individuals who are in the topmost percentile for coronary heart disease with genetic risk have fivefold increased risk of uh, disease. And here, this is looking doing the same study for obesity, where you ascertain a prospective cohort for genetic uh, for polygenic risk for obesity, and you realize that if you see looking for birth to middle age there are at increased risk for extreme obesity, bariatric surgery, coronary heart disease, and all the comorbidities associated with uh, obesity. So here's another way we can be able to predict risk and risk stratify patients. Nonetheless, these genetic risk scores have all been, uh, polygenic risk scores have all been developed in European populations for the mostly, and the portability across the ethnicity really varies quite a bit. So we have to be able to address this uh, across the board. Uh, and so an example of this is how this kind of genetic risk scores can help is with IgN nephropathy, uh, really, uh, you know, the disease that I study, it's a glomerular nephritis. Uh, it's the most common cause of kidney failure in East Asia, uh, and is really rare in Africa, and then intermediate in prevalence in Europe and North America. Uh, and so when I went to medical school, it was explained to me that there are very few doctors in Africa, and that's why you never diagnose IgA nephropathy. There are very few nephrologists, no biopsies get done. In East Asia, uh, the nephrologists are way too aggressive about doing kidney biopsy, and so they over-diagnose this, so they diagnosis early, and in Europe and uh, North America, we do things just right, and that's why we have an intermediate prevalence, okay? So, um, and then the major issue is who develops kidney failure in this, and so just a snippet, we've done genome-wide association studies, again, to, uh, in part of collaboration with Christoph Kurluck. We've identified now, you know, uh, over 30 loci for this uh, disease and computed genetic risk scores, but when you project the genetic risk score uh, for IgA nephropathy uh, across 85 populations across the globe, you could see that in East Asia, the, there's a much higher genetic risk for IgA nephropathy in the population compared to Africa, and Europe is somewhere in between. And this was a bi-ethnic GWAS, so this was not influenced by sort of differences in population prevalence as we asked in ascertainment. Uh, and so it was clear that whether you calculate the genetics risk score based on European or Asian uh, uh, you know, genetic risk scores, it's always the gradient is, uh, you know, toward, increased towards uh, uh, East Asia. And so, in fact, this starts to explain some of the variation in, the, you know, uh, prevalence and frequency of uh, IgA nephropathy. It wasn't just the doctors who are not making uh, the diagnosis. And from, and we just saw some results from H3 Africa from a biopsy study that was published, uh, that was presented at the Kidney Week uh, this last month. And out of 765 patients that were biopsied, only three had IgA nephropathy. So there, it's very, very rare in Africa. Uh, so, uh, and presumably because of genetic and probably environmental factors. So, so um, just to say that, you know, we need to do a better job of ascertaining these polygenic risk scores across different populations. And so this is a paper by Don and Mark Daly, which highlights the risk of not doing this uh, properly across different uh, ethnicities. And I'm happy to say that I'm one of the multi-PIs of the uh, NIH All of Us program, and we are really trying to do this right. Uh, with uh, increasing diversity uh, across different populations. And so we have 84% of our populations here in New York can be included as one or, you know, into one or more of the underrepresented in biomedical research categories in terms of race, ethnicity, 
uh, gender, educational atta attainment, uh, income, and, and geography. And we look forward to this study uh, really going forward. Uh, there are over 240, 30,000 individuals who have been recruited so far. Uh, 22,000 of them are in New York, and we look forward to this being uh, you know, a landmark. Project, uh, and we're trying to do all we can to enrich this for kidney diseases. So we make sure that we're uh, we, we study the kidneys well uh, in this cohort. So. Um a lot of different uh, opportunities for making a primary diagnosis, the thinking about prognosis uh, and risk of recurrence of disease based on genetic uh, testing. Uh, we can think about selection of therapy uh, in some cases, but not enough to think about th targeted therapy, yet we can avoid some deleterious treatment or fetal treatment for some patients. Uh, there are a lot of risk factors that we can identify for patients to risk stratify them better. We can fa screen families and donors. We can think about surgical complications for transplant or vascular procedures based on secondary findings. Um, uh, we can think about risk of cancer uh, in this patient population. Uh, we can think about risk of diabetes. Again, this entire, these different, different examples here. Uh, and then risk of uh, atherosclerotic disease and vasculopathy. And then finally, there's a lot of opportunities for pharmacogenomics, particularly in the transplant population. So I'm going to stop here. I want to thank all the folks who have been involved in these studies. This has been a really multidisciplinary effort. Uh, I want to mention Hila and Emily, who've done a lot of the frontline work on uh, the genetic diagnostic part, collaborations with Simon Sanakerki and Christoph Kurlock. Uh, the collaboration with the Institute of Genomic Medicine and David Goldstein was really essential, uh, as well as uh, sort of working with the eMERGE group, all the pathology and nephrology group at Columbia, collaborators at AstraZeneca, and then the NIH cohort to seek its study in particular. Uh, and then all of our funding, and I've benefited quite a bit for a number of different NIH initiatives, whether as being part of the network or funding mechanisms. So I am very grateful for all the support. Thank you. Clarify the point I think you were making at the end about polygenic risk scores. I, I understood the, the general point about the lack of diversity in some yes. of the data, but was there something unique about kidney disease that you and you were trying to make that where that either polygenic risk scores would or would not be of, of high utility, or you're optimistic about their use for kidney diseases? Well, I think they would probably work for the, in kidney disease, and we have an interesting opportunity in the sense that a large number of patients are diagnosed via biopsy. And so we can come up with a precise clinical you know, picture to build a polygenic risk score. And so we'll be able to see whether for some of them this is going to work better. For chronic kidney disease, I think we have GWASs that looked at kidney function, but altogether the polygenic risk scores don't explain a lot of the variance uh, in risk. So it's not like obesity or uh, you know, coronary heart disease. We'll have to see how those get deployed, and then because differences in heritability across different populations, uh, it may, for, for kidney disease, uh, it may play out actually differently for, uh, for, for kidney disease. So we'll have to see this. I'm excited to test this uh, actually in the eMERGE cohort. Ali, that was a wonderful talk. Can you um, help us think about how a nephrologist in practice is going to approach selecting genetic testing? Um, does everybody get tested? Um, do a select group? How, how do you think about that? So, um, uh, you know, uh, I think probably right now, the best way to think about it is uh, you know, based on our sequencing project. We found that the highest diagnostic yield uh, after a sort of clinical workup was in patient populations who had cystic or congenital kidney diseases, glomerular diseases, particularly nephrotic syndrome, and those that have a very strong family history. And I didn't get a chance to mention this, but family history is really an important predictor of a positive diagnostic yield. Um, a number of studies have also shown early onset uh, of disease, obviously. So I think if you start to think about those parameters, uh, that's really important that to, this will increase your diagnostic yield for, you know, during sequencing. Particularly but if they have congenital or developmental uh, issues, I would think about microarray to look one of these microdeletion uh, syndromes uh, as well. Uh, so 
Uh, and then the last category were, you know, uh, CKD of unknown cause. If you've exhausted all your options and you have a young person in whom we have unexplained kidney disease, I think this is also a good, uh, good example, a good situation where you can do this. Um, and then you could see where, uh, where, where we are. Uh, I think most studies so far have supported this sort of paradigm for testing. Uh, I think that the diagnostic yield across the other categories are going to be smaller. And so that's, you know, up to you and up to the insurers really to decide whether this is going to be, uh, you know, sufficient to be able to sort of order the test and pay for it. Would you guess at a percent that do you would recommend testing? A percent the, of? Putting together all those indications, is that 20 or 30 percent of? Well, uh, if you think about family history, 30 percent of the patients that we deal with have a positive family history of kidney disease, and it's regardless of their. Uh, it's going to uh, be greater yeah. than that. Uh, yeah. And so that might be one cut that you may want to take, and if you take early onset kidney disease, that might be another way of uh, right. trying to look at it. Okay. Uh, so, but I would say clinical evaluation, somebody who really thinks about the patient before we wind up wearing the uh, genetic test. But you can imagine in the future, we're gonna live in a world where everybody's gonna get their genome sequenced, and then the challenge is gonna be the diagnostic interpretation and the predictive value of the ge genetic interpretation. All right, okay, thanks. Hey, uh, thanks again for a great talk. You, you talked a little bit about transplant eligibility on uh, population that um, uh, might, be, uh, might have APL1 uh, mutations. I'm wondering if you could speak a minute about um, donor eligibility uh, in the context of this new discovery of APL1 mutation and whether or not you suspect or, or fear that uh, donation receiving, receiving organizations would be less likely to accept donations from people with African ancestry because of a risk or fear that they have yeah. APL1 underlying unknown. Yeah, well, so that's the, that's the whole rationale behind doing the Apollo study, which is going to look at this exact question prospectively, and I think this is really essential. There's, there's a lot of uh, data, uh, most of it is retrospective, and based on this, there are a lot of recommendations that are out there, and medical centers are acting on this already in some different way, many different ways. So there isn't a uniform approach. It's very clear that from the retrospective data that uh, donors who have dual risk genotype are at increased risk, but it's not every single one of them who's destined to develop uh, kidney failure, and I think that the only way you're going to wind up doing this is by uh, doing this prospectively and studying this uh, really well uh, to see exactly who you want to uh, select for transplantation, uh, and not creating a disparity, as you're, as you're saying, of labeling individuals as being high risk. Identify really folks who are truly at higher risk for developing kidney failure if they donate, and then actually this will be a way of uh, improving sort of allocation and reducing the fear in the community. There is fear about kidney failure because everybody in in the African American community, there is awareness that there's an increased risk of kidney failure in, in general in the population in terms of knowing about the, this genetic risk factor. Some proportion of the population also knows about it. And so they are informed uh, and they, they also want, uh, the t they come to you and they ask you want uh, the testing done uh, as well. And so you have to be able to provide the data. And I'm hopeful that the Apollo study will provide the data so we can Thank do this. You. Thank right. you. Thanks again for a wonderful talk. Um, you, in your early slides, you classified uh, glomerular nephropathy and tubular interstitial nephritis separately from um, diseases of unknown origin. Does that yeah. imply that we know the origin of those two diseases? Or I'm talking as a clinician. So we have these uh, labeling, uh, you know, we have these diagnostic criteria. Uh, and so there are, you know, diseases that we know that affect the, primarily the glomerulus, uh, you know, mostly based on biopsy. And there are diseases where you could see the glomerulus is intact, but most of the pathology is in the tubular interstitium. Uh, and so those, cat those categories of diseases have been shown, at least, you know, in terms of genetics, they're different. And so you do classify them differently. Uh, but uh, in terms of looking at the precise molecular mechanism pathogenesis. In the subset of glomerular diseases and tumor interstitial diseases, we actually do because we have genetic disorders, so we know uh, what the gene is. Sometimes we don't know what the function is, and so, so on and so forth. So you can go down you know, that, okay. uh, that path quite a bit. Yes. Um, beautiful, beautiful, very clear talk. So, so I understand that genetics are primary to everything. We want to talk a bit about second hits. Yes. I mean, you know, yep. are there things that we should be looking for after you do the genetic testing? How's that? Sure. I think that's, uh, you know, the, uh, the second hits, I think, in, in, the, in the case of APOL1 is really critical. Uh, I think the story about the, the increased susceptibility to HIV nephropathy 
tells you something about inflammatory pathway, viral infections. Uh, and there's a lot of data about inflammation increasing the expression of APOL1, and that might be a milieu that may exacerbate or you know, unmask this genetic susceptibility. So I think that there's a lot of, the, so the genetic data can actually sort of sometimes give you a window into sort of the environmental uh, you know, cause of uh, disease as well. And so that might help you. So you know, if you find a mutation in a metabolic pathway, uh, you know, so the CoQ10 mutations, uh, path, the CoQ10 pathway, pathway mutations that give you FSGS. Uh, they're right there as a metabolic pathway. You know that the, what the environmental sort of uh, uh, therapy for this would be a CoQ10 supplementation. Um, for IgA nephropathy, this gradient that we're seeing uh, across the, uh, the globe for the genetic risk score for uh, this disease correlates very well with the prevalent, the diversity of helminth. Uh, and so it makes you wonder about intestinal pathogens and, you know, mucosal defense. And so here, uh, I think here this is where the germline data can help you understand the, the second hits and environmental factors, but we're still in it's not, we still don't have enough information. Hi. So, Ali, given the fact that the number of genes that you found mutations in wasn't a, a massive number of genes, could you envision something that, like the clonal hematopoiesis assays that are going on in the hematology field, where they're now kind of screening for a select group? Yeah. of genes instead of necessarily sending out these patients for whole genome or yeah. whole exome sequencing yeah. that might make it a little bit more available for a larger yeah. group I, of people. I, there are definitely now the targeted panels available uh, across the board. In fact, that's some of the recommendations right now is to think about the targeted panels so then you, know, you don't have to worry about secondary findings and so forth. Uh, and then you ask a very focused, you're testing a very focused hypothesis. Um, you know, so it really depends. We've actually looked at the, the performance of targeted panels by creating virtual panels out of exomes. And for cystic and congenital diseases, those virtual panels would work nearly as well. Not nearly as well, but nearly as well. And same thing for glomerular disease panels. So I think a lot of it has to do with the reimbursement policy and the insurance that the policy that the, the patient has. Uh, and, uh, but in terms of cost effectiveness and thinking about sort of reinterpretation of variants and new genes that get discovered, if you do a genome or an exome, you'll be able to interrogate that data uh, again next year and next year, whereas the ability to reinterrogate is more limited when you're doing a panel. Okay. A great talk, thanks. Uh, so question, when looking at the um, diagnostic uh, return for doing the exome sequencing was quite high, 9.8%, but that was actually based on a fairly probably conservative calling of which variants might be pathogenic because there's yes. a lot of them that are unknown, the regulatory agent in yeah. there. Have you started looking at, if you look at different definitions, a less conservative one, how much of a difference in the potential diagnostic yield you might get versus the one that was just based on established pathogenic variants? Um, yeah, so we, we did a companion paper where we tried to say, okay, how what's the burden of rare variants in different genes across the genome in an effort to discover new genes? And you can sort of look at the delta, let's say, between the rare variants in collagen genes that you didn't detect with this method and, uh, you know, by variant annotation. And there's a small gap uh, there that you can detect based on, you know, really filtering for ultra-rare variants. If you start to relax some of your filtering criteria, you're going to find a lot of signal. But I think a lot of it is going to be spurious and just background noise. So I think you have to fine-tune this uh, to sort, sort out where you are. And probably there's a bunch of, and this, this tells you this problem of variants of unknown significance uh, that uh, you're going to discover in any cohort you sequence, and sub, a subset of those are likely going to be real in the long term. They may be uh, valued as being uh, real, but uh, I think the data shows that the majority of them are going to be benign uh, in, in the long term. And I think we just don't have, but in, in the individual case, it's tough to make that decision without any other type of data besides the sequence change. So. Um, so uh, Dr. Rogers had to leave because of a meeting at starting now. But I want to thank everyone, and I want to thank Ali for a really beautiful talk. Stick around for our questions for a few minutes. Yeah.